wetlands out of the dam, you've maintained the integrity of the dam. And if a crack develops through a particular zone in the dam, these filters and transition zones are designed such that material will flow into that crack and stop it up. And that's what we call the self-healing aspect of a zoned embankment. One of the primary features is a zone just upstream of the core. It's uh, called a crack stopper, and it's a clean sand. The idea is that when the core develops a crack and water rushes through it, you've got a zone of clean, cohesionless sand, sort of like a bucket of sand at the beach. And when water flows through that, it cannot sustain an open crack. It collapses, it washes into the crack. To make sure the embankment's core would bond firmly with the abutments, they needed to be thoroughly stripped of all plants and loose rocks, then excavated, shaped, cleaned, treated. A lengthy and laborious process, much of it done by hand. At Seven Oaks, precision handwork always played as important a part as heavy machinery. One of our fundamental responsibilities during excavation was to identify zones of weak or incompetent rock. Uh, whenever these zones would be encountered, we would direct the contractor to remove the rock. And if any shaping were necessary, we would also direct them to do shaping. Throughout the years of construction at Seven Oaks, contractors used explosives to break up rock. The controlled use of explosives made it easier to excavate materials and build access roads and tunnels. Safety is always a concern when working with explosives and heavy equipment. Inspectors made daily rounds to make sure everyone followed strict guidelines. Uh, as a core safety person, I make sure that the contractor safety people are adhering to all of the rules and regulations. If there is ever a safety violation that the contractor refuses to take care of, I have the ultimate say. I can shut the job down. Uh, I would probably go to the resident engineer at that time and tell him of the problem if it isn't quite life-threatening and let him do it through uh, memorandums to the contractor. But life-threatening, I would shut it down in a heartbeat. A lot of times you have to make sure you have eye contact with the equipment operator because uh, sometimes they just don't see you. There's too many blind spots. Oh, you lift some heavy loads above your head, you're working under heavy stuff. I mean, uh, like this thing here, you get up around it while it's running and you got 300 pounds of air pressure. You, you know, you just gotta watch out for yourself so nothing happens. Safety was always a top priority at Seven Oaks. And this was reflected in the outstanding safety record of the project. Our safety record is 0.71. The national average is 10.6. In other words, the Seven Oaks project averaged only .71 accidents per 200,000 man hours worked. Less than 10% of the national average at 10.6. So everybody involved is just extremely proud of this, this record. I attribute the excellent safety record, probably the involvement of all the supervision, uh, upper, middle, supervision, the Corps of Engineers, um, even the employees themselves. I have seen them stop somebody from doing something that was unsafe. Core Los Angeles District is really proud of uh, uh, safety records and as being a project manager, I, I'm proud of that. While the abutments were being prepared for the embankment, Workers began excavating and preparing a foundation in the riverbed to support it. The central core would lie on bedrock in what's called a core trench, about 100 feet below the surface of the riverbed, averaging 150 feet wide and about 1,200 feet long from abutment to abutment. Core trench is used to extend the core material all the way down to bedrock, so you have a positive cutoff of the water coming downstream, not only the surface water, but the groundwater that's seeping through the alluvium. If you didn't excavate the alluvium, which is about 90 to 100 feet deep in this canyon, a uh, large amount of water would just seep through that and exit at the downstream toe. So for safety considerations and to have a more positive 
control of the water. We excavate the trench, put in core material to get a good seal, build it back up. Great care had to be taken in refilling the core trench with core material. The material had to be compacted to the correct density and bonded at all contact surfaces to guard against seepage. Tests were performed regularly to ensure the quality of the compaction. Once the core trench was refilled, work on building the embankment could begin. The crew had to make sure that each level, or lift as it's called, had the proper thickness. Each lift had to be firmly bonded to the lift below. Materials needed to be compacted precisely and at the proper moisture content, as required in the design specifications, in order to achieve the correct density, lift by lift and zone by zone. Downstream of the dam, conveyor systems were built to deliver the construction materials to the dam site. Without the conveyors, the contractor would have needed more than 40 additional trucks to haul material. The reason we chose conveyors instead of trucks, uh, cost effectiveness. You can imagine it, a 550 foot high dam with such narrow access roads, having 45 trucks running through, plus the 16 that I have here, so we are talking about 60 trucks, 85 ton trucks. The belt is a much uh, more cleaner job. Uh, if I had 60 trucks running here, uh, we would have much more damage to the environment. At completion, the embankment would stretch almost one half mile from toe to toe and would contain 36 million cubic yards of material. Uh, probably the, the best comparison I give you is, is about a half a yard of, of uh, rock would probably fill up the average person's pickup truck at home. So uh, it would take a long time to build a dam with pickup trucks. <laughs> Seven Oaks intake tower was designed to be angled and anchored to the left abutment because of the area's seismic potential. Five foot thick reinforced concrete walls would provide added strength and stability. The tower was designed to be constructed in two phases. Before the tower could be anchored, the first phase, or rear wall, had to be built. After the concrete had set and the formwork was removed, workers drilled holes as deep as 125 feet into the abutment. Then they installed steel tieback anchors to secure the tower. Once the rear wall was anchored to the abutment, the second phase was to construct what are called the multi-level withdrawal system, the wet well, and the high-level intake. The multi-level withdrawal system will channel water flow from the reservoir. It uses steel grates to screen out sediment and debris. As sediment builds up and covers the grates in future years, a crane will slide concrete blocks down a slot in front of the tower's openings to cover them and keep sediment from entering the tower. As the sediment level rises to higher openings, more blocks will be stacked. The wet well was built in 10-foot lifts or levels. Each lift required about 300 cubic yards of concrete. Look on, on the highways and you see a truck mixer, these big trucks with this big rotating drum. Each of these truck mixers takes 10 cubic yards. So it would be a 30 of these loads. The main wet well will be used when all the grates in the multi-withdrawal system are covered or when the reservoir water reaches the high level intake as in the case of a flood. The high-level intake has what are called trash racks to keep out floating debris. For tunnel inspections, a steel bulkhead gate slides down to the base of the tower to shut off water flow. At completion, the intake tower rises over 200 feet above the reservoir floor. Since the outlet tunnel was used to divert the river around the dam site during construction, 
The control gates could only be installed toward the end of the embankment construction and during the dry season. Upstream of the gate chamber, the tunnel is 18 feet in diameter. Uh, downstream of the gate chamber, it becomes a horseshoe shape configuration, uh, 18 feet wide as well, with an arch on top. And that carries all the way through from the gate chamber down to the, to the downstream end of the tunnel. It becomes an open channel, a rectangular channel, 18 feet wide, until it empties into a plunge pool. The gate chamber was built at about the midway point of the tunnel. Two main factors determined its location. First and foremost, an interior gate chamber is less vulnerable to earthquake ground motions. Second, the gates need to be accessible for maintenance and repair. The unusually wet winter of 97 and 98 posed a major challenge for tunnel completion. A small diameter diversion pipe had been installed earlier to divert water flows while crews were working in the tunnel. The heavy rains overwhelmed the pipe and stopped construction. And if the gates couldn't be installed and the tunnel work completed before the next winter's rainy season, it would delay the project for another year. Meanwhile, the people and property downstream would be unprotected in event of a major flood. Showing their creativity under pressure, the Corps negotiated with Southern California Edison to use their flume to help divert the water from the tunnel. The gates for the chamber were shipped pre-assembled by the manufacturer, rather than having them assembled by the workers on site. The crew hauled the 90,000 pound units horizontally into the gate chamber. They tilted them up and aligned them, then secured them in concrete. In spite of the weather, the Seven Oaks Dam remained on schedule. With the dam in full operation, water will flow through the outlet tunnel at high speeds. This will produce turbulence, air pressure fluctuations, and vibrations in the downstream tunnel that could cause damage. An air shaft that was built above the gate chamber is designed to aerate the flow and eliminate this effect. The vertical air shaft had to be precisely drilled over 300 feet through the left abutment to the gate chamber. This meant drilling a 12-inch diameter pilot shaft down to the gate chamber area, then attaching a cutter head onto a drill rod inside the gate chamber, then using a drill rig to pull the cutter head back up through the rock, creating a shaft with the proper dimensions. About 8 million cubic yards of bedrock were excavated from the spillway. Most of this material was used in building the embankment. As they excavated materials from the spillway, crews benched the sides. Benching is a technique that helps reduce the steep slope of a mountain and also catches falling rock so that crews can work safely. Once the excavation was complete, crews dug a 10-foot by 10-foot trench across the spillway floor, then filled it with concrete to make the spillway sill. It set 1,000 feet from the mouth of the spillway and stretches 500 feet across the spillway floor. The sill prevents floodwaters from eroding the upstream side of the spillway. In June 1999, the last truckload of material was delivered to the embankment worksite. This milestone called for celebration in the form of a topping out ceremony. I, I can't tell you how emotional it is being out here this, uh, this day and seeing the, the last uh, shovel of dirt put on the top of this, this dam. It's just, just beautiful. There's, a, there's really no words for me to describe what it means to me to see it completed like this. We are very proud of having a chance to work for the Corps of Engineers and performing this huge job. Um, it was, it has been always a challenge to achieve all the milestones. I felt just overwhelmed, absolutely proud of myself, my team, and the Corps of Engineers. I've, I've been in the service of my country in the Army and Army Corps of Engineers for 23 years, and this is the biggest day